Let's start with a word of prayer, if we would. Father, we look to you as the great leader of all of us, and we look to you for all that you're doing in these people, in this church. We just thank you for the blessings you give us every day. Thank you for this church and the things we're going to be able to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's go around and everybody say their name first. I'm Jeff Evans. This says so. So we might just kind of shout out first name, just in case everybody doesn't know everybody. Justin Greenfelder. Tom Miller. John Houston. Mark Ricker. Kevin Malatich. Fred Sandheimer. Mike Oldham. Angela Clark. Tony Kazenko. Elizabeth Kazenko. Lily Jones. Cole. Lisa Tucker. Chris Tucker. Lee Blair. Thank you. Always oh, good to start with now. So just a little bit about me. I, I put this up here not for any reason other than why would you listen to this guy? So I've done a lot of a lot of work in leadership. I was 20 years the CEO and chairman of the Wilbert Company in Orville, Ohio. We had 400 employees all over the world. Come in, come in. Outside. I've spent about 100 years total on boards of directors. The smallest company I've been involved with was $6 million, and the largest is multiple billions. So Firestone, Tiger, Rubber, GenCorp, Aerojet, and Wilbert was way in the lower end of that, but kind of in that way. I've been fortunate. I, I got all Ohio training. I went to Muskingum College and Bowling Green for an MBA, and then I got to take some classes at Harvard and Wharton and uh, Kellogg afterwards. Not necessarily all on leadership, but it all sort of comes back to that. Um, I have a book I wrote, Strategic Alignment, Success Through Values Driven Leadership. Actually, I wrote most of it, Ben wrote some of it, and Tom said I should bring it in case anybody wants to read it, so I left a couple copies in the back. Um, so that's me. So what is leadership? Here's a couple of people that know something about it. We all know who Bill Gates is. And he says, as we move into the next century, leaders will be those who empower others. Empower others. John Maxwell, you, you've probably heard of John. His, his statement is, leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Influencing people to do what, what you need to get done as a leader. So I looked at that a little bit and I said, well, I think there's a leadership definition that we can go with, and it's Getting things done to other people. And there's not one thing here, there's two. You gotta get things done. If you're a leader, it's because you've been given a task. Let's get something done. I don't care if it's in business, in your home, in your church, it's getting things done. And then the second half is through other people. Nobody can do it themselves. Um, so you, so it's just it's a matter of making sure that how you're how you're working with people to help encourage them, all those things, and, and we'll get into a lot of that. Who are some great leaders? I need, I need somebody in the back row. Raise your hands. Just give us. It doesn't have to be a back row. I'm kidding. <laughs> Tell us some great leaders that you know. Just shout them out. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Excellent example. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Yep. General Patton. General Patton. So we're already in, in ministry, military, and. Um, Business. Any others you want to pop out right away? Tom Landry. John Landry. Tom Landry. I'm, mm -hmm. So I've got a list. I'm sorry. This thing's reversed. i got to remember to go the other direction. I listed a few here. Interesting. We've already hit a couple of them, but Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi, Steve Jobs, Billy Graham, George Washington, Winston Churchill, John Wooden. What makes these people great leaders? Great results. John Wooden, did he win, I think, eight straight national championships? Of course, he had Freeman Dr. Jabbar, and then he moved on to Bill Walton. But that's okay. Other teams were great also. Winston Churchill had a saying, I, I'm going to take a nap every afternoon, and I only want to be awakened in, in an emergency. And I further defined an emergency as the armed invasion of our island. So I, pretty clear. The clarity in these guys is amazing. Steve Jobs, when he went back to Apple, the first thing he did was he called, uh, called together all of his senior leaders. And there was a huge room. And he said, I want to hear all the things we're working on. Give me a list. 
Oh, they, they, this and this and this, and they're all important. And they, they had a hundred things on the list. And they said, now, I want to narrow it down to the top 10. Oh, no, we can't do that. We can't do 10. These are all important. No, no, no. You got to give me 10. So they gave him 10. And I said, now, I want you to rank them 1 to 10. Oh, no, we can't do that once again. But he did, and they ranked him 1 to 10, and he did it on a whiteboard. Then he took a marker and crossed off 4 through 10, and he said, we're going to do these three better than anybody in the world, and we're going to build the company on it. And that's what they did. So think about leaders. A lot of these leaders have a terrific focus. They also have a terrific empathy. George Washington easily could have been King George I. Chose not to. These guys are also good leaders. They got a lot done through other people. So leadership is something that can be good, but can be bad. Obviously, everyone here knows what good leadership is, so we're going to focus on that. So what's involved in good leadership? I work on the rule of threes. You can build a stool with three legs. You put four or five, and then it's hard to keep them level. You put two, it falls down. Three is it. The triangle is the strongest uh, geometric shape we have. I had a person I used to work with. It didn't matter what you ask her. How does this happen? Why does this happen? She said, well, there's three reasons. And she admitted to me, sometimes when I start talking, I don't know what the third one is. But there's going to be three. So my three for tonight are purpose, structure, and method. But we're just going to focus on those three uh, for this this short four-hour session. <laughs> So purpose, the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? It starts with a vision or a mission. And these are different. And I'm sure you've worked through mission statements. Some of you have, maybe some of you haven't. And a company works through a mission statement, works through a vision statement. Often the mission statement is something that you get a lot of collaboration and, and you work it and you work it and 50 people and 100 people put their two cents in. Oftentimes the vision just comes from the leader. But the vision is where are we going? What are our hopes and dreams? What's our future state? Mission is, who are we? What are we doing? What's our reason for being? They're both important. And they're both, um, they're both part of the purpose. So I'm going to start with vision. What makes a great vision? You think forward. You're, you're, we're thinking forward thinking. Uh, if you've got a great vision, it's not something you've already done. That's like having a bucket list and not putting things on the list until you've already accomplished them. I do that. It doesn't make for a great vision. So a good vision is it's future focused, it's directional, specific, clear, relevant, purpose-driven, leader-led, inspirational. That's a lot of words. Let's look at an example. 1961. I go back a long ways, but it's probably one of the best vision statements I've ever heard. The United States was in, a, was in a battle to see, were we going to win the war in space, or was the Soviet Union going to win? So on a, May 25th, 1961, in a speech to the Joint Section, Session of Congress, President Kennedy said the following, and I can't do his accent, so I won't try. I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. He went on to say, no mission will be so expensive or so important. But this is really the key. Let's, let's see. Is it future focused? Yeah. Is it directional, specific, clear, relevant, purpose driven? Yeah, we want to win space race to, to protect ourselves. Leader led, inspirational, it was all those things. I'll give away the, the end of the story. We, we landed a man on the moon and brought him home safely again. July 15, 1969. So we met all those goals. Now, there's a lot that happened. You start with a vision. The vision then drives a mission, and not one mission. One of the missions that we had was uh, double the spending on math and science education. One of the missions was uh, we needed better software and better hardware. And so all these things bridged off of that. And this is where you guys all come in, because some of you are the leader that's giving the vision. Most of us are one step down trying to figure out how am I going to support that vision and that mission, specifically in the church. If our church is 
uh, to prepare ourselves for our next pastor and to address the items that were, that were identified in the survey. There have been a lot of teams set up and a lot of people that are engaged in that. And what you're doing will support the big mission. Some other vision examples. To become the world's most loved, most phoned airline. Who's that? It's hard to say today. It's hard to say today. By the way, they're the only company in the industry that I think makes money all the time. For a lot of reasons. Yeah. Bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. If you have a body, you're an athlete. Thank you. Thank you. To build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Yes. Yeah, no trouble with that. So, these are some examples of some visions. I didn't list the examples of bad ones, but you've all been places where the vision is to delight our customers and grow our business. Um, something you don't have any earthly idea what they do. It has to have some, some rationale in there as to what we're doing. I would say that the vision of Jackson Friends Church right now is in process. That's what we're all doing. Together, we are, we're working to develop that. We know our mission. I'll get to that in a second. But our vision is, our vision can be different. My son-in-law is, um, is a lay staff member down the street at a church. Their vision is they want to continue church planting. Um, they have 10 church plants now that they've done in the last so many years, and that's where their focus is. Is that going to be our focus? I'm not sure. Maybe it's church plant. Maybe it's missions outside of here, continuing what we're doing in places like Jamaica or Albania or Oklahoma. Um, maybe it's maybe our vision is that we'll have 600 people attending every Sunday by such and such a date. These are all good visions, and we're working on it. And all of us, all, all that we're doing is going to help get there. Mission statement's a little more clear. I've read that in several places. It's not always the same words, but it's always the same meaning. Reaching our surrounding communities with the gospel of Christ through equipping believers who will carry the ministry of the local church into the world. Pretty specific. It's pretty clear. It's what we do. It's who we are. Not necessarily the vision of where we're going in the future. That's okay. This is, this is what we do, who we are. In the Great Commission is another way of saying it. Um, Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For a long time, I've seen in bulletins and newsletters, our mission as a church is the Great Commission. And it's not different than the other one. Sometimes the words don't matter as much as what it says. So if we know what mission we're trying to reach as a church, it makes it a lot easier for us in our committees to try to figure out how we're going to do what we're going to do. Same way in your businesses. If you're working for a business, and you know the mission of the business, a whole lot easier to develop your department, your departmental goals and move forward. That brings us to what is your mission, your mission for your team. Um, some quick examples. When I, when I went through the survey that we had last September, October, it identified a number of areas where we needed improvement. And everyone knows that. That's, that's what it said. Some of those areas were discipleship, first impressions, social media. And as I go down that list, those are all the items that are being identified and, and worked on on the uh, transition team. So if I'm on the transition team and I'm responsible for any of those items, I know what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to, to hit the mission of the church through the things that I'm doing. We all have building block pieces that are going to grow it. So mission vision, it provides your focus or your stake in the ground. It's what you can build everything upon. Another way of looking at it, Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Life. And it's the same thing. If your life is based on a, on a purpose, if it's based on a mission, mission and statistically, you live longer and are happier. Personal mission statement. 
do any of you have a personal mission statement? I got this idea from a seminar I went to about 30 years ago. Probably took three or four years to get it right, but this is my personal mission statement. I am a Christian man who loves and supports my family, and I constantly try, strive to improve all facets of my life, spiritually, physically, and intellectually, at work and at home. With that as a mission, it makes it easy to develop goals and easy to prioritize my actions of what I'm doing. And so I, I would encourage you, if you feel like you should, if you, feel, if you, you don't feel it, try it. See what a personal mission statement will feel like. So we've kind of pounded on the why and the, the purpose. Let's go on into structure a little bit. Anybody heard of John Cotter? John Cotter is, is a very famous Harvard Business School professor. He's known worldwide for change process. And he has an eight-step process. Without getting his, I hope to do this without sounding overly professorial or something, but it, it's really kind of a good thing to think about. The first step in any change process is create a sense of urgency. If people don't understand why we're changing, they'll never change. If they don't understand that it's really important, we got to do it now, it won't happen. So back in September, October, when we got this survey that said, you guys aren't where you should be as a church, that sort of set a sense of urgency and lots of things started to happen. Form a guiding coalition. Well, we have a transition team. The transition team has sub-teams. Those sub-teams are working with other people. You know, throughout the church, we're engaging other people in other areas. Formed a group to do praying up for the services. I mean, there's so many examples. But you're going to go through some changes. You need a small group to start it, and then we'll get more people working on it after that. Develop an inspired vision and, and convey the new vision Again, we're still working on that, but we see enough of the pieces to, I think, start feeling good about it. Empower others to enact the vision. So once we have a vision, then get other people on board to, to make it happen. And to me, number six is one of the most important ones. Generate short-term wins. And in, in, in this case, it's generate and celebrate. Celebrate your victories. Um, a lot of times you'll see a team that gets started, and boy, they're all ready to go. Everything's great. It's a six-month project, and day one, man, they're humming. Then the real work starts, and morale just really goes down. And then towards the end of the project, comes back up, and you get it done, and you feel pretty good about yourself. If you know that's going to happen, it's easier to deal with, and it is going to happen in virtually every project. But it helps to look at the small wins along the way. Um, one of the first meetings we had in a transition team the uh, John Custer was running a group for um, first impression, and they had some new signs for them. Just a couple signs. Boy, that was inspirational. That got things started. And then you start feeling better about the team, and then more things follow on after that. The last two are further down the line, and they're almost permanent, and that is sustain the acceleration of the vision and institute permanent change. But if, if you think of nothing else out of this, just remember that it's you, you got to start with why. I started with purpose tonight, right? Why are we changing? Get some people to help you figure out where you're going and start start getting some short-term wins. Clarity. Um, yeah, it's, it's not very easy to do a job if you don't know what you're doing. Clarity. When do you need it done? How does it need to be done? How many people are going to be involved? How much money do I have to spend? Whatever. Um, and, and communication. If you think about communication, Dr. Tom talked about this last week. He said, uh, there's various aspects of communication. What I think I said. What I actually said. What he or she thinks I said. And what she thinks I really meant about that. And it went on and on. And Communication needs to be clear. The, the goals need to be clear. Everything needs to be clear. The more clarity as a leader you can provide, 
better chance you're going to have your team perform where you need them to. Uh, I said communicate like a journalist. I don't know if we have journalists anymore, but when we used to, they had seven questions they answered for every story. Who, what, why, where, when, how, and to what extent. Well, if you answer those seven, you got it. And that's the, sort of the checklist that they went down. Well, I use that same seven-step checklist in my, in my teams throughout work. Sometimes my job was the why. I just had to do the why. And we delegate somebody else, and they figure out how. And we work between us to get what. But there's a lot to be said for, remember, just a couple of little cute, cutesy like who, what, where, when, why, how, and to what extent. Ah, meetings. This is part of structure. We have meetings all the time. In your business, in your... Some people have family meetings. You have meetings all the time. And people hate meetings. Why? I looked up some reasons why people hate meetings. Meetings start late. Or they start late without even a reason or letting people know. Maybe everybody's sitting there, you're ready to meet. We just keep talking and talking and talking. So now it's 7.15 and your 7 o'clock meeting is 15 minutes in and you haven't had a chance to do anything. Lack of structure. Why are we here? What's the meaning of this meeting? Are we we're going to accomplish anything? If you don't have either of those, then you're wasting people's time, and people hate to have your time. So there are a lot of reasons to hate meetings, but there's ways to make them better. Um, I think I'm pretty structural. I try to be anyways. It's a recovering CPA. Meeting invitations. Let people know when the meetings are. Where? When? And for how long? You know, meetings that start at 6 o'clock that go on to 11 o'clock can frustrate people. Unless you tell them in advance, this is going to go five hours, there's just no, no way of getting around it. Calendar keys. You've probably all been involved in groups or meetings where at the end of the meeting you try to pick the date for the next meeting, and you never find the time that works for everybody. Uh, we have a pretty good cadence here. Elders meet the second Thursday of every month. And the finance team has to be ready for the elders, so finance team meets the Tuesday before the second Thursday every month. You can't say the second Tuesday, that might work. But everyone knows up front, at the beginning of the year, this is when we're meeting. Now you can make some changes, of course. If, if everybody can't get there or, you know, it just doesn't work out or if it hits on the 4th of July, okay, make some changes. But have some structure. People appreciate more. Have an agenda. I've got an example of an agenda here in just a second. Keep everyone involved. So if you're leading a meeting, and let's say all of us are in the room for a meeting, and no one talked except Kevin. Kevin talked for like three hours. I didn't do a very good job as a leader. I didn't get in, I didn't get the things out of everybody else that I should have, and I let one person dominate. So as a leader, you have to find a way to um, encourage people to talk. You know they all have things to say they wouldn't be part of the team. Encourage them to talk and gently take the mic out of the hands of the person that talks too much. Make decisions. Why else would you have a meeting? It's, if you want to share information, just send an email. But if you want to have a, a didactic conversation, just send an email. But if you want to actually discuss and come to a conclusion, meetings work pretty well. And it helps a lot, too, if you take minutes. Otherwise, you don't know what you talked about. And I'm not saying minutes like you've read where this person said this, now this person said this. No, here's the major decisions we made or the major action items we have. It's not that hard to keep up with. Matter of fact, you can do it all on one sheet. This is a, an example of an agenda that I used to use at Wilbur, and it's kind of hard to read, but uh, it, it sort of puts everything in one. And this is a complicated one, no question. It starts by showing the time. The meeting here is 3, 4, 23, 9 to 10, 30. It's got the mission of the church that we're supporting. It's got the mission of the transition team, so we don't keep, we keep that in mind. And we list the items we're going to talk about. That's that. And there's room over here to keep keep notes as you go. If you need a lot more room than this, you're probably writing down too much. Now, it doesn't have to look like this. Lots of good agendas just have the date on the top and then number one through six and the things we're going to talk about, and that's that. And that's fine. But I would encourage you to have something. 
And if you can, get it to people ahead of time so that they know. Now, if you're formal in a, say, a corporate board, the agenda gets set ahead of time, and everyone agrees to it. If you want to add something to the agenda, you add it ahead of time. Because when you show up on the day of the meeting, you're not going to get to talk for a half an hour about something you wanted to bring up. There's just no room in the agenda. We're not nearly that formal, obviously. And most of our businesses meetings aren't necessarily that formal. But having an agenda really helps keep things together. And another structure you may think of is if everyone's giving an update in their area, they only have to say three things. It's always three. Here's what we said we would do last meeting. This is what we did do and how it worked out. This is what we're going to do after this meeting. That's it. Three things. We don't have to talk forever. But uh, it keeps everybody involved and everybody on board as to where we're going. And it really helps. It's, it's a team that everyone gets updated as to what everybody else is doing. Everyone know about SMART goals, or does, have all of you used SMART goals in the past? So, SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-based. Somebody give me an example of a, of, one, of a goal that doesn't meet this, that we're going to work on it. Give me a goal that isn't a SMART goal. We're going to grow revenue. There you go. Perfect. We're going to grow revenue. Well, it's a little specific, but let's say we we want to grow it. How do you make it measurable? Add measurable to it. So we're going to grow revenue 20% a year for the next five years. If you've grown your business at 15% for the last five, you probably that's probably relevant and achievable. If your business has gone down, and now you're going to grow at 20%, it's probably not cheap. It's probably very relevant. If you've got a business and you're growing sales 20% a year, you're probably going to do better on the bottom line, and that's good. What I typically found in business that I saw a lot of SMAR goals. It's easy to make a SMAR goal. We're going to improve our quality 1% per month, and that's it. Oh, when? When does it start? When does it end? Um, it's, it's the same way with, with the goals that you have, whether it's a goal for, for family or a goal for business or, or whatever. It need, you need to get all these pieces in. I'll give you an example. This is kind of a fun one. It was uh, 1992. A friend and I decided we wanted to take our sons into the Grand Canyon. So we first set a vision. We said... Before May 31st of, 2020, of, of uh, 1993, we will take our two sons safely and hike into the Grand Canyon, stay for a night, and safely hike back out with them. So we got the safety part in there, the wife's like that. Um, that was pretty specific. It was measurable. Did we do it or did we not? It was achievable. Um, the boys were old enough and the dads were young enough. And um, it was relevant because it was a great time. And time based, we knew when we were going to do it and how long it was going to take. So um, it was it was a great time. And I have to tell you that I, when I wrote this, I didn't know the corollary to the story. Last night, my son and my grandson came over, and my grandson said, "Papa, here's a walking stick. You're going to need it." I said, "Why?" He said, "The hardest hotel in the world to get a reservation in is Phantom Ranch, the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We got a reservation next year, so I get to do it again." This time with my son and my grandson. I'm going to make him write the SMART goals for it. <laughs> so again, what are your goals? What are your goals for your team? If, if, you're one, if a goal is um, grow attendance, well, you don't have all the pieces in here. The more specific you can make them, the better. Make our music program better. That would be a goal that doesn't have all those pieces. Now, I can tell you that's not what Samuel did. Samuel looked and said, we need to rearrange what's on the stage. We need to vet all the performers. We need to uh, improve this material and, and do this. And, and the result is really good. Communications. Talked a little bit about this earlier, but a couple of things. First of all, more is better than less. 
the best communicator I ever saw was a consultant that was helping us when we were going through a turnaround. Every meeting he left us at the end of the day, he would write a 20 page email. And I thought, this is crazy, but he didn't leave any stones unturned. He was also pretty candid. I remember when he first came in, I said, uh, so are we going to make it? He said, I think so. I've seen worse, he said. That was his pep talk. More often is better than less often. Consistent message. If you can say the same thing 10 times, five different ways, probably people will get it. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second. And don't be afraid to repeat yourself. Develop a cadence. Okay, if you have a, a quarterly newsletter that you pass out, a monthly newsletter, um, if you're going to update your Facebook page every Thursday or whatever, you develop a cadence and it helps keep us going. And then more is better than less. Well, I said that once, but it's okay to repeat yourself. Some examples. At Wilbert, we were employee-owned, so we tried to share as much information as we possibly could with our employees. So every quarter, we had an all-hands meeting. And my staff and I would give an update to them. Here's what's going on financially. Here's how this is going. This is the new contract. This is where we're at with this and so forth. And then they would ask questions. I, I learned early on nobody liked to stand up and ask a question because they were afraid to embarrass themselves. So we'd let them give questions ahead of time. But then we'd answer them. Um, we had weekly staff meetings. And each staff member of mine would then have his or her staff meeting. They would share all the things we could share from our meeting. And then their staff did the same. So we'd have that trickle down. Um, we had a Facebook page and a website. We had, um, we had a monthly lunch with the president where we'd have eight or nine people come and, and have lunch with me. I'd tell them what was going on. They'd tell me what was going on from their perspective. And then they'd go out and share it with everybody. And I didn't think that was quite enough, so I invented something. The company was called Wilbert. So we formed something called News from the Burt. And News from the Burt might come out three times a week. It might not be every two or three weeks. But it would be when something cool happened. We got this new contract. Um, this person uh, and their wife just had a baby. Whatever. Cool things that we wanted to celebrate. And I have to, be, I have to say the church does a really good job with communication. And it's improved. We have bulletins. We have announcements in the service. We have monthly newsletter. We have a website, a Facebook page. The Facebook page is linked to Instagram. Um, there's a lot going on. I'm not saying we can't get better. But again, the more times you say something and the more ways you say it, better off, the more likely that it's, it's going to get through. Some people learn by hearing, some by reading, some have to be convinced. We all have different ways of learning. So. As we communicate, we've got to talk all different ways. Delegation, this is all part of structure. Remember that leadership is getting things done, but it's getting things done through other people, not doing it all yourself. Why delegate? Well, there's a number of reasons. It all makes sense. A lot of times people think, well, I've been doing this so long, nobody could do it better than me, so I'm going to keep doing it. Well, there's a couple of things. Probably if you delegate it to somebody else, they'll learn quickly how to do it differently and better than you because they're looking at it with fresh eyes. Also, if it's something that you're doing, it's, been, it's a pretty important thing. And if you're going to delegate it to someone, maybe it wasn't your most important thing, but it might be their most important thing because it was pretty cool for you to do. Um, now, how you delegate matters. I remember early on in public accounting, I was running an audit, and there was a young lady on my team, and she was struggling with something. I, I don't remember what it was, and she's, she's working hard, and I let her work on it for about an hour, and she couldn't quite get it. And I went over and said, what are you working on? She said, oh, this, and I can't figure it out. I said, oh, do this, 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 and this. And then I probably walked back to my seat thinking, boy, I just helped her out a lot. She, you know, look at that, now she knows what to do. And I looked over, and her head down, and she's just sobbing. There's a difference between delegating and disempowering people. So I've learned a lot since then. Tried never to do that again. Uh, the technique that seems to work pretty well is some, if someone comes to you and says, I got a problem. I don't know what to do about such and such. The first question that I always ask, wow, that's interesting. Well, what do you think you might do? They usually know. They just need the encouragement to speak out. So basically, delegation is preparing your team 
delegating responsibility and authority. You can't tell somebody you have to do this, but you're not really in charge of it. And then get out of the way. But again, the leadership's about getting things done, so you follow up to them. Whether it's a church, business, a law firm, doesn't matter. Um, if, if someone says, I'm going to do this, the leader has the right to say, hey, how'd that go? Did you get that done? None of us are fire anybody on our teams or anything like that, but that doesn't happen in business very much anyway, so it's kind of you work with people and they learn how to get better. Method. Third leg of the stool. So there are a lot of styles of leadership. If you look at CEOs, CEOs in the 90s and the 80s were, they were like little gods. Lee Iacocca and Stan Galt and all of those. That's not the same style as today. The best leadership today actually fits pretty well in the church environment is because it's servant leadership. And you've all heard about it, and a lot of you probably know a lot about it, but what is servant leadership? Focus on others. Help others to succeed. Um, don't just help, have others help you succeed. I had a boss one time that said that would tell people, he said, you need to get better at this because you're costing me my bonus. Oh, boy, that was good. Now, can you imagine how motivating that would be? Actually, at Wilbur, everybody got a bonus. Every employee. Um, at least 18 of the 20 years I was CEO. Now there was only 17 years that the management team got it, but we paid everybody in the factory every chance we could. That's, everyone's got skin in the game. Everybody's more involved. Again, start by listening and asking for feedback. I mentioned the, the question of what do you think? There was a really good movie a long time ago called Maverick. It was the old one. It wasn't the one where the guy flies, it was the card player and, mm -hmm. and James Garner. And he gets in, I think it was him. I think it was his. No, it wasn't. It was the next one where it was Mel Gibson. And he joins this card game. And the guy said, well, you're a great card player. He said, we're going to lose. He said, no, 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 I promise you, I'm going to lose for an hour. And he did. He didn't bet much, but he lost for an hour, and he learned everyone's tells. So at the end of the hour, he started winning, of course, because he knew when this person went like this, they had a great hand. And the other one, scratch here, they, they were bluffing. Start by this. That one of the best things that you can do, especially if you get a new job and you're at work, um, don't go in day one and tell people what to do. Go in day one and figure out what's going on. Then you can add a lot of value. Be empathetic. Relationships matter. Um, forged from shared mission and trust. One of the things I had to learn as a CEO is my main job was probably to make sure that we hit our numbers and that we succeeded and satisfied customers and all that. But probably I spent more time walking around the factory, talking to people, saying, hey, how's your how's your daughter's soc soccer team doing? I know they were doing pretty well. I go over to another guy, and I knew he loved fishing. He would talk about where he was getting crappies down at this lake and all different things. Those kinds of things really give you the relationships that you need to lead people. You can't just start off and walk in the front door and say, here's what we're going to do. It doesn't work very well. Make others feel respected, appreciated, valued, and engaged. That's being a servant, servant leader. Lead to influence, not authority. Uh, most of the best leaders I've seen in business came from product management. Now, product management is such, let's say you're working for a company and you're in charge of Tide. So you're, gonna, you're in charge of the Tide detergent brand. Um, somebody else makes it. Somebody else sells it. Somebody else does the marketing. Somebody else probably does the pricing. But it's your business. You're responsible for it. And nobody reports to you. Product managers have to learn how to lead through influence. They have to convince the manufacturing guy why they should ramp up their production schedules, why they should be on time 98% of the time, not two. They have to convince the marketing people that, I know you work for a marketing VP, but could I suggest you do this? And so influence management, influence leadership really works. Um, and then if you do get to a point where you have the authority along with the influence, it, it works well in tandem. Um, lead by example. Model good behavior. Um, I remember we had a neighbor. 
she had kind of a crusty mouth. And um, she'd be talking to my wife, and she'd say a swear, and she'd say, oh, I'm sorry, Alita, I know you're religious and all. But she recognized that. And I can remember times in, uh, at Wilbur where we have a big di- uh, dinner, and people would come ask me if I'd pray for them before that started. I didn't wear a cross on the outside of my shirt. You didn't do those things. But you model behavior, and as leaders, that, that gets your point across as well as anything. Um, a good example here, I mentioned some of those high-flying CEOs. There's another guy that I wanted to mention named Alan Mulally. Anybody heard of him, Alan Mulally? He was a vice president at Boeing. He did not get chosen for the CEO job. It's a Ford hire. Um, and he turned Ford around. He turned Ford around when all the other auto companies were getting money from the Obama administration. They got bought out, and then were beholden to the government. The government had to decide who they hired and fired and all that stuff. Not Ford. And Alan Mulally was a servant leader. One of the first things he did, he had a Monday morning staff meeting with all of his worldwide senior leaders. I don't know if there were 20 or 30 people or whatever. And they all had to list their major programs and projects they were working on and call them red, yellow, or green. Red means going bad and I'm not sure what to do with it. Yellow is it's not doing very well, but we think we have a plan to get it fixed. And green is everything's green. So the first week, wouldn't you know it, out of the 20 leaders, every project was green. Look at how good we are. Uh, they were failing. <laughs> Somebody couldn't be doing it anyway. But he worked with his team enough to where finally he had someone agree that came one week and one of their items had a red. He said, wow, I'm very proud of this. Let's, let's talk about it. And he had all the different managers from around the world kind of pitch in and figure out, hey, I've done this before. Here's what we did to solve it. And a couple weeks later, it went to yellow, and then it went to green. Of course, the next week, other people had red items also, because they knew they could talk without getting their heads cut off. Um, he was a servant leader. I even got to meet him one time. There were a couple hundred of us visiting and touring the facility. He was walking around shaking hands and talking to people, and I just thought he was maybe a mid-level manager until I realized who he was. He was pretty successful. I think he, after his time at Ford, got to like a three quarters of a billion dollar net worth. Certain leadership can be good. Attributes of a servant leader. Um, a teacher. Encouraging. It's sharing accountability. Staying mission focused. I picked those four because they spelled the word team. I'd like to put humble in there, but I couldn't figure out where to put the H. And you've all seen servant leaders, and you've seen the other kind. They can all be successful, but you're a lot more successful at getting things done through other people if you're a servant leader. A couple of little things. Teach, don't tell. I already talked about my mistake with the young CPA. Bill. Make others better. Read the room. Now, read the room is an interesting one. If you think about, you're in a meeting, this person's talking all the time, you can see some other people getting frustrated because they can't get their work done. Read the room. Slow that person down and say, you know, that's really cool, but what do you think about this? Do you have something to say, or could, I, could, could we hear what you have to say? Do those kinds of things. I was in a meeting one time where the CEO was running a meeting, and um, he was a Davis Cup tennis champion from South America, but he was now CEO of this company. So he was a bit fiery. And the meeting was ramping up and it was getting a little loud. And and um, at one point then he finally, he stood up and he said, gentlemen, ladies, let's take a quick break. I want to talk about this. And he went and got a coffee pot. And he walked around the room and filled everybody's coffee, co- coffee pot cups. Not everybody drank it, but that act of servant leadership brought the whole attitude of the room down. I always look for a chance to do that, never got the chance. <laughs> so I think you probably know who my best example of a servant leader is going to be. Think about that 
bracelet that we used to have, WWJD. If you could think about that in a leadership standpoint, you know, teach through parables. Teach, keep things focused on the mission. Um, yeah, without even getting into the details, I think you all know. You know fantastic leader. Did he get things done? Yeah, he changed the world. So to wrap it up, yeah. We're trying to get things done through other people, both pieces. They're both important. Um, again, remember that it starts with purpose. Understand the vision, understand the mission, align around that. Point two is the structure. Have good process, consistency, smart goals, communications, delegation, all the things we talked about have good structure. And then the method being servant leader. And as you go, celebrate your wins. The more you do that, the more you'll find that people are attracted to what you do. They're going to want to join. The people that are on your team are going to be happier about it. Uh, gets everybody engaged. And that's it. Can I, well, first of all, uh, would you mind, Elizabeth, on, oh, that mic is here, not there. I just have one real quick page summary of everything you talked about. Okay. Take one of these. I know you've taken some notes. Um, the beginning. But this is a one page cheat sheet. Questions, thoughts. Um, anything I said that you don't agree with, or well, probably a lot of things, things we could do differently. You're ready for the question. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, then you're welcome to. If, if there's something you want to ask about later, I put my email and my phone number at the bottom. Um, if, if you want if you want the book, the book goes into a lot more detail on most of this stuff. It's available on Amazon. You can get a Kindle or whatever. Tom thought I should put some books in the back of them, so I did. Um, Jeff, I've got one. Please. So one of the things that I've seen between different businesses that I've either represented or been a part of is leaders who surround themselves with a small group of people that advise them in decision making mm -hmm. versus leaders who form numerous committees. Those committees include a lot of people. They all meet, they decide things, they report up the chain. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a view one way or the other on which one's more efficient, which one you've seen get better results? My view is going to be skewed because mostly I've dealt with employee-owned companies. Everybody wants to treat their employees like owners, and ours really were. Uh, so we wanted to get as much decision-making down into the, into the depths of the organization as we could because they all had skin in the game. But beyond that, I also felt like every decision that could be made deeper in the company would be better. I saw way too many decisions made at the top that showed that they didn't really know what was going on. Here's an example. At Wilbur, we had a um, we had a part that we were making, and it used four foot by eight foot sheets of steel. And somebody got the bright idea we were saving money per pound if we bought four by 12 foot pieces. Um, that we did. But we started losing money on certain jobs. Nobody could figure it out. And they went out and they asked the operator, why are we losing money? We didn't used to lose money. What are you doing different? He said, well, I can tell you what we're doing. I need four by eight. Give me four by 12. I cut off the other four feet and throw it away. <laughs> so I've, I've seen way better results by getting more people involved, even if it's just in focus groups. It's helpful to have a team around you, too. You need a senior team. You need a senior staff. They don't, they can't all be the same. They, I mean, they can be. They can be all white men if they're different ages and different thinking, but it's way better if they're men and women and a 30-year-old with a tattoo and a 60-year-old and whatever. Diversity of thinking, diversity of ideas is critical. Thanks. Okay. Others? Who are some of your favorite leadership authors or maybe someone has a podcast that you like to follow? 
I really like Jim Collins. I think he's amazing. Um, Good to Great is one that a lot of people quote. I've met him a couple times. Matter of fact, I was at a breakfast and I've been in this group for a long time, so I got to sit next to him and I talked to him. And we had just turned 100 years old. And so I gave Jim Collins a Wilbur 100 year pin. And I said, Thank you. You've been really helpful to us. A lot of your ideas are things that we're using. And he said, Well, you know what I call 100 years in business. And I said, No, what's that? He said, A good start. So the rest of the conference, some would be very bragging about. We've been around for 60 years. He'd say, well, that's pretty good, but you're not as good as a good starter over here. <laughs> and the next, the next week, he sent me a box with every one of his books in it, hand-signed. Jim Collins is an, an icon. I'm a little peon. And he thought enough to send that to me. I thought that was another act of servant leadership. So I think he's great. Um, still like Stephen Covey. I just listened to a book recently called, um, oh shoot, it, it's about keeping the main thing the main thing. I'll send that book. Is that right? Give me one second. My daughter actually recommended it to me, and it was pretty awesome. If you look at my library, you'll see what I just researched. Essentialism. It's by um, Greg McKean. Anybody heard of essentialism? Mm -hmm. um, his main point is we all let too many other people drive our lives. So he says, like, if someone invites me to a meeting, I feel I better go. I was invited, and you go and waste your time, and, and you feel frustrated. And someone says, here's a project, you want to do it? And you say, well, I don't want to turn them to learn. So make them feel bad. So yeah, I'll do it. Well, essentialism is all about. No, the main goal is this, and this is the mission. If this doesn't fit that, I have to say no, and learning to say no. So those are just a couple that I thought were pretty good. We we'll get done in less than an hour, so that's pretty good. If you have any other questions, I'll be around, and you got my contact information. So thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for some of you for sitting in the program.